Hi there, Raj Jha here with Hannah Mears. We're doing another case study. And if you're trying to figure out how to market, it's not always obvious the best way to start. And we've got a really interesting one here today because I don't think we've dealt with this uh, question before. We've got a company that's actually using direct mail. And that sounds a little wonky because that's, that's super old fashioned. Like, what, what is this? Like stuff showing up in your mailbox? But it actually, I think it, it really merits a discussion here. And it's a, it's a great way to just, uh, you know, give them a little bit of uh, guidance and hopefully teach you a little bit about direct mail too, because I think it's super interesting. So, so Hannah, tell us a little bit about us, about this uh, case study and, and what you think. Yeah, I think a lot of people go off and just write off direct mail because they think it's a it's a dying thing. But I'm really excited to hear all of Raj's insight on this. He knows exactly how this has been changing over the years and why it can still be effective. Why our profile is super relevant. It deals with a lot of mental health. And as we know, a lot of people during this pandemic have been really looking for resources and outlets to vent to and help with their mental health issues that they've been going through. So this could be really relevant to a lot of people over all of the time, but I think it's really important now. Our profile states, these days, many people don't have someone to talk to. Depression and loneliness is increasing, and I'm launching a platform where people can get access to licensed therapists anonymously. All you need to do is create an account and be connected with a therapist. Everything is anonymous, so you don't have to worry about privacy concerns at all. Like I said, I think or my initial thoughts about this is it's really attractive, anonymous, it's giving you an outlet without making you seek referrals from anyone. It's something that you can do on your own and it's important in this time. The situation though is if we hone in on what the product is, our costs are about 20% less than going to an in-person therapy session in most parts of the country. We're selling packages of sessions from one session up to 10. The per session price goes down the more you purchase in advance. If after the first session, the patient wants to cancel, they can get a refund on their package. This lets them lock in a good rate and not feel like it's a big risk. We've been at it for about a year, but haven't grown as fast as we'd like. We could take 10 to 20 times as many patients as we have now, but are struggling to get new members. Raj, before we go into their question, you gave a thumbs up on some things that they have. The refunds for the people, the 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 package per sessions, the yep. if you buy in advance. This is something we've talked about before with these online systems of whatever it may be to have these types of things. We said have packages, have sessions, have incentives, and also have refundable ways that if someone's in this and they decide not to like it. So give me your initial reaction on why the thumbs up so that we can yeah, just get that. <laughs> the the, th the thumbs up because because I I don't think we can take credit uh, for this because I don't know that they encountered us when we did our case study on this. However, they're doing something right, which is the packages. And you know, we did another case study where there was a a online service with a very high price point, looking for a monthly continuing subscription, and that's a tough hurdle to jump into. By having this package, however, someone can just taste it. Right? They can say, oh, well, I only really want to try one session or I'll try 10 sessions. But they've done something actually even more clever, which is just sign up for 10. You'll get the 10 package price. You'll get a discount. right? And then if you don't like it after the first one, then you can cancel and get a refund. So what they're doing is they're encouraging consumption and they're encouraging people to, to take the first one, try the product, and hopefully they'll like it. And hopefully the whatever therapists they have uh, in the network will do a good job and they'll want to do more. So... I think the whole packaging thing is great and doing these, uh, you know, it's, it's not a novel concept, like my, my kickboxing instructor does the same thing, right? I buy in packs of 10 and that's how he sells. It's like, you can buy the, the one for this much, or you can buy 10 for this much. It's like, oh, okay, I'll take the 10. So I think it's a, it's a really good way of, uh, packaging the thing. So that's, that's why the thumbs up. So, you know, I know that's not really the topic of today, but definitely merits a, 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 a little bit of encouragement there. But it's important because before they move forward to this next part, that would have had to have been done. They have laid the groundwork. Now here's their question. We saw some medical practices grow using direct mail. So we started with that. We're running a campaign to doctor's offices in Atlanta, inviting them to send patients to us. It's doing okay, but it's very expensive. We're thinking of adding a refer friend program to existing patients to get them to refer more. What are the other ways that we can grow? So if we go ahead and discuss the concept and how it relates to people wanting privacy, I think this could be 
a great thing. So in terms of that, what is your initial thoughts? Because I think that's an important piece of this that we need to talk about first. Yeah, I think if the whole premise is privacy, like the whole premise is anonymous mm -hmm. therapist, right? So if that is the premise, then mm -hmm. privacy is the reason why someone is doing this, right? Presumably they're leaning hard into that and that's great. But that also means that the refer a friend program sounds like it's doomed to fail. I mean, if the kind of person that you're you're talking about wants to do something that is private, uh, you know, are they going to really refer it? It's like, hey, I've got this great therapist. I'm going to refer you. Well, if the reason I joined is because I want it to be private, I'm not sure that refer a friend concept is going to have legs. So I think I'll challenge that one a little bit. I'd love to be proven wrong. But uh, you just have to think about the mindset of the person coming to the program. If they came into it for privacy, they're not going to refer. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to just check off the list at the front so we can hone in onto this main direct mail thing, but also yeah. think of the different ways people think of private. Private to some people may be completely to yourself or private to you may be between you and your family or you and your best friend. So I think people have different aspects of what privacy means as well, which is why maybe that could work. But yes, if we're looking at privacy in its general concrete definition, it's between you and your person. So keeping that could be something we need to back off. In terms of direct mail, Raj, they're used, they want to start using this direct mail because of what they've seen and how it works. Is direct mail dead or is there a benefit to this? Well, uh, think about it this way. Do we still get direct mail? Yes, we do. So clearly it's not dead, right? So it is still able to, if you think about these direct mail uh, letters that you get, I, I just threw one out. I shouldn't have thrown it out, but I just got, you know, the ASPCA just set, sent me a, do you want to, you know, come and join, be an, uh, be an animal advocate, et cetera. And I just tossed, uh, tossed that one. Um, however, how could they afford to do that? They do millions and millions and millions of dollars of direct mail and they wouldn't be doing that if it didn't work. So whenever you see St. Jude, whenever you see uh, you know ASPCA, whenever you see Goodwill doing direct mail, so clearly that works in that context. And then you also see offers from local businesses. So you can't say that this doesn't work because it's old school. It definitely works because direct mail, unlike digital, is one of those things you're fronting a large amount of cash to get this done. And you wouldn't do it more than once if you completely flamed out on it. So yes, it can absolutely work. It's just a very different beast. Um, but mastering it is really nice because it's super repeatable. So I think that's my high level on, on direct mail. So what kind of companies should be using direct mail then? Because they talked about doctor's offices using it and they're sort of in the same platform of, of a medical type of field and practice. So should they be the right fit for this? Are they the right type of company? The answer is maybe. <laughs> so it, direct mail works really well for ge geographical targeting. Um, so if you're if you're using if you're trying to reach some of your local business and you're trying to reach within a certain radius, so a doctor's office might be trying to reach within a certain radius, or you know an auto body shop, etc. These things might be reaching within a certain radius. So that makes a lot of sense if it's geographic. The other way of making sense is if it's interspaced. So uh, the charitable ones make a lot of sense because you can typically identify people by the lists, the mailing lists that you buy, uh, that these are the people who have a, donated in the past to one one thing or another. It's probably why I get a bazillion of these because, you know, you make a few donations and all of a sudden there's a, you know, they're all selling their mailing lists to each other. So there's a pig pile and now I'm getting, you know, asks from a whole bunch of different charities. So I think if you have a, a, a tight group of people where you can identify them, um, or if it's geographical, then I think it makes a lot of sense. So let's say they start using the direct mail, but their biggest question is sort of how do we measure if it's working or not? I think that comes to be one of the drawbacks with it that you would think is it's not just like having a link out there that you can see, okay, are people clicking on it? Am I getting data from this? How do you get data from direct mail to know it's being, it's being used successfully? It's super, that's a really, really good question uh, because you think that, oh, I'll just write this note, this uh, this letter or or this direct mail piece and then, you know, something will happen and how do I know? So in the older days, um, what you would do is typically have just a phone number that's a unique phone number so you can track the calls. So that's the number one way of doing it. But even in the now, there's a, there's a cool thing that's happened in the last, let me guess, I guess it's old now, like in the last 20 years, um, uh, 15 years, which is called a personalized URL. So you might've seen this where you can actually track. So you'll see there's a direct mail piece and it's uh, come to our veterinary office, join at raj.localvets.com. 
And when you type that in, it's going to flag, ooh, Raj, who got this email or got this uh, direct mail, actually type this in. So there are some ways with uh, these unique phone numbers to say that you can track whether or not someone's actually taking action. So it's not quite as granular as the online advertising, but it is trackable. So it sounds like they should give direct mail a shot. They, they may be the type of company for it. They may not, but you're not going to know unless you try. There is a way to track it. What are some other ways that they could be using advertising without it just being direct mailed out if this fails? Yeah, so I, I would encourage them if, if they're saying their direct mail campaigns aren't really succeeding. Now, first of all, they're not doing direct mail right now to directly to consumers, right? They're doing it to doctor's offices. And that's a, there's a big difference because of the doctor's office, you know there's a concentration of people that might be a good uh, patient for them. So direct mail to consumers, that would be a totally different uh, ball game. And if that's the case, you typically don't want to do direct mail unless you have a high probability it's going to work. It's really expensive to test, mm -hmm. right? So you, in order to test and have enough uh, data to test, you're going to have to drop like 5,000 pieces, all right? So between the postage and the printing and sourcing the lists, I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. So I actually think that they should test offline or online and then take that offline if it works. So really doing some targeted tests and saying, okay, well, you know, can we try some online advertising? And then if we have an offer that actually works, if people are taking us up on it, then go back to direct mail might be a better way. Direct mail can make a lot of sense for doctor's offices or if you're going a on a business to business perspective, because these businesses aren't getting as much mail in the mailbox, but going direct to consumers, it can be really hard to make it work. Um, so I would start with online and then transition to offline marketing if that works. Mm -hmm. I think that's really great advice, especially for this such this digital age, you may have to be careful on how you approach this for sure. And I know we have to wrap up here soon. But Raj, something that really stuck out to me was you kept honing in on the difference between direct mails to doctor's offices and direct to consumer. What is the difference between those types of campaigns that are being sent out? Because I think that's important to decipher between. Yeah, it's, it's very different because it, it, it's when you're going for a uh, business development relationship like a doctor's office, you're not going to send the same kind of thing. You have to think about what's going to happen. So the mail goes to the doctor's office. The receptionist, the front desk person is going to probably look at it and say, is this something that should be given to the, the doctor who owns the practice? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't look right, it's going to get the circular file right away. It's like, that's gone. So, so it's going through your hands before it gets to work. Exactly, right? You have, it, it's what's called a gatekeeper problem, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and anyone who's ever done telesales to businesses knows this. You have to get past the secretary in order to get to the person you try to reach. Mm -hmm. Direct mail, it's the same thing. You have to get past the office manager who's tossing 90% of it. So you have to make it look valuable, make it look private, make it look personal in order to get there. So what they might be experiencing with it being eh, so, so successful is it looks like junk mail or it looks like an advertisement instead of looking like a, maybe a handwritten letter that you know you hand address it because there's not so many doctors in the radius you hand address it and you stamp personal and confidential on the outside you know only for doctor you know sue jones and that way the gatekeeper's like oh i probably shouldn't open this one right this is personal and confidential um, so you think about ways to get past the gatekeeper or you send a package Right. Sometimes there's what's called lumpy mail. Lumpy mail is you're sending something that could be a gift or something that is uh, just going to get attention. But when you send a package, a package is far less likely to be opened by the front desk person because it looks personal. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about how do you get past the gatekeeper? So, you know, a few tips there. But sending to a business or to an executive is a very different kind of thing than sending to a consumer where they're going to open it and they might say, oh, that's interesting and do something about it or directly from their mailbox because they're the intended recipient. But I still think that's an interesting way to even do to some some consumers here and there, people that, you know, maybe seeking this type of advice or help is still making that envelope feel really, really attractive to open and not just say junk mail. So I agree. I yeah. think that's a really unique way to get past people. Everyone still appreciates handwritten letters, handwritten thank you notes, handwritten anything. So the more handwriting you can put on something, the way more valuable your company is because not a lot of people are doing it anymore. And I still think it holds a lot of weight. Anyone, anyone appreciates you writing something personally to them. So I think that's a great way. If they're going to use direct mail, do it in that way. Make it as personable as possible. And just also take advantage, like we said, of the digital age of how to measure this before you go all in and are too deep to back out. So Raj, thank you so much for all of your advice. I learned a lot about direct mail. I love that it can still be a used as a strategy. And I think we know 
exactly how now. So thank you so much for all of your insight. All right. Thank you. And see you all next on the next case study.